hoping to have answered. Raise your hand if you have a question, we'll bring a mic around. Yes, up here, hold on to the mic. Uh, I was curious. What's your name? Uh, my name is Anthony. Anthony what? Anthony Albert. Okay. Um, and I've seen a lot of bands over the years that use electronic effects that are pretty cool. Recently, I just saw Devo, for instance, and uh, others can't dream a dream. Do you, do you uh, follow some of those bands? I mean, uh, have you influenced them? Or have they talked to you about some of these effects? Devo, Tantric Dreams, did you influence them? Or did they influence you? These are bands, <laughs> rock bands. He goes to rock concerts and he sees his light shows. And he wonders if you influence them. <laughs> Not much. Uh, bands. Uh, Devo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, I've heard the name. I've heard the name. Very well. Different worlds, maybe. Right. But parallel. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah, well, we could talk a little bit about you. You talked about making records that sort of similar to painting, and then you did the live performance of Silver Apples. I'm wondering what made you decide to do that in light of your thinking about recordings as painting. So the question is about recordings as uh, studio art, and uh, then you did a live performance of Silver Apples, is that right? Yeah, it's not Silver Apples that we're performing, it's, it's something like Silver Apples. The difference between the, it's a good question, um, the difference between my original idea of the record player being the medium was basically what the record became, which is mostly post-production. Post so when you get finished with a record, in the original form of, of what I grew up with. That was just, when I, when I did Silver Apples, the long playing record came, it was just, you know, days before, when you could get an amazing amount of material on a record, 15 minutes per side uh, on, on records. So up until then, you could just get a few minutes. And, and so, and, and it was high fidelity. Um, <laughs> Um, that's a joke, but that was high for the time. But, but, um, but it, it, the idea at that point was with a record, it's, it's a permanent, it's permanent. It, it stays that way forever. Um, and, and so the, the whole notion of the record is whether you're playing a Beethoven string quartet or whatever it is, it stays frozen at that point. And the and so you want you want it to be I took me thirteen months to do silver apples. And the reason it took me thirteen months is because I wasn't gonna let it go until I couldn't make any more changes. It was always gonna be this way. And by the time I finished, it took me ten years to get to the point that I I really felt comfortable with it. The cassette came. I was done, thank goodness. But we had, we had CDs and we had cassettes. The CDs were a step way beyond what you could do, but you could get an hour of music on a CD. DVDs where you could do quad. And then, then the cassette came and, and lowered, the, lowered it to the most awful sound you could imagine, and we kept going down after that. And, and, and then, then you reach a point where there's no more, now with the, with the, with, um, the computer and the, and the web, there is no final version. I mean, you're downloading things. People are downloading three minutes of this and two minutes of that. The whole medium has changed radically. In the meantime, uh, when I went out onto the stage, I, I had nothing against a live performance, but it shouldn't be perfect. It should be spontaneous in some kind of way. 
Um, and so you, you, it's the opposite of what I, of, of, of the, it's, I, I think I called it the antimatter uh, brother. Uh, it's of, 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 of the perfect record. The perfect record needs to be perfect because it doesn't change, at least in the original form. And then, but if I wanted to do it something that anywhere came as, as with the, the kind of um, uh, complexity that I put into the record on the stage, it required, at the beginning when I first tried to do it, it required about 400 pounds of equipment and a, and a, and a person I was going with me. So um, it, it was really hard. And I, I longed for the day that I could get a digital version of all the book book. And, the, and, and that has actually happened now. Now the performance of As I Live and Breathe has 47 Buchla oscillators in it. All is copied and pasted, pasted. And they're great. They're absolutely as good as the original one. And I have the entire Buchla. I have taken about four years now to develop it, but I have the entire Buchla multiplied by at least five, six times in my computer. And I, it, it's, it's eight pounds all together. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, it, it's now, now I can get the complexity on the stage that I was unable to get up until the, the last several years. So I'm really, really happy that, I don't know if that's answering your question, but um, I'm answering some questions. <laughs> Switch it over, and a lot of overdubbing. 
because I only use one table word. What I learned from silver apples in the moon is you, you lose all the highs. So I had to I had to rethink it when I did the next one. And and start because of the redubbing process. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't know anything about that. So I had to go back and I, I began to learn to 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 wait to do a new overdub until I got everything done and then do do the overdubbing with the starting with ending with the high stuff and then starting with the low stuff. Interesting. And um, um, Richard Friedman, who's in the audience, brought you a book of Yeats uh, that had the title in it. Uh, do you recall that? The Silver Apples of the Moon is a quote from Yeats, is it? Yeah, it's from Yeats. Yeah, the Silver and, Apples of the Moon. And do you remember Richard bringing you the book and saying, here's a possible title? No. Richard, yeah. Yeah, he brought the title to me. Yeah. Yeah. Just wanted to make. Uh, Make sure, because he's been telling me that for years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, read the, I read the poem, he gave me the poem. And we, he didn't give me the title of Silver Apples of the Moon, he gave me the poem. Uh, isn't that right? Where's he here? Kind of right. He's <laughs> <laughs> here. Kind of right. Yeah. But it was, it was the two lines Silver Apples of the Moon, uh, golden, golden Apples of the Sun, or something. What's the quote, Richard? That's right. It's the song was Wandering Angus by Yates. And I had heard it two nights before uh, I, I met with Ward at the studio in, in Wicker Street. And I said, why did you call it Silver Apples of the Moon? Because Gold Apples of the Sun has already been taken. <laughs> oh, the great rapper is <laughs> Ray Bradbury took Golden Apples of the Sun, so he said, why don't you take Silver Apples of the Sun? I don't remember that. But you know, you know another thing about that, you probably didn't know this. Um, I read the whole poem, and it's it's a quest. And that's what I was on. I was on a quest. And uh, so it seemed reasonable. Originally, my daughter is here tomorrow. And originally, um, uh, my two children were Tomorrow and Stephen and I was going to take their names and put it backwards. Amarat and Stephen. Net, net, okay, I can't do it anymore. But, but, uh, it, but it was going to be a journey of, of those, those names. And then he brought the uh, uh, the Yates in and that settled it. Yeah. Good work, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> Chamber music with the orchestra. I went with the opera. 
but I never got to school. I never got to, I, never, I couldn't take any courses because I was on the road all the time with, 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 this, uh, with, with the football thing. It was, um, um, what was his name? Um, the coach? No, the, the, the guy who did the extra kick, the, the extra point kicking was Tommy, um, Oh, I can't think of his name now, right? but but he was the conductor of the band, you know? and he would he would put the, he would get up and he, they'd make a, a touchdown and we'd play dee 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 and then he'd go out and kick the extra point. <laughs> Yeah, the the riding backwards in the car. <laughs> yeah, have you had more experiences where you feel like you're going the opposite direction uh, from everybody? Um, by the way, I have to throw in here that Henry Cowell, who lived in San Francisco, was a composer, had a Model T, which couldn't go up the hills, but he found out if he went in reverse, he could go up the hills. Yeah. And so Lou Harrison would tell stories about him going up hills backwards and then we got it. This, this, this car, that was the beginning of, of um, automatic shifting. It was called, I forgot now, Stand fluid, fluid, fluid drive, oh. it was called. And it, so all the front, front gears just didn't, they weren't fluid anymore. We had to go back. That's why I did that. It was, it was quite an experience. Do you think people are following you now instead of you going against uh, the I don't think anyone's following. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't, I really don't, don't, I think everyone, I'm doing something that everyone thinks they're following, but I, I really still feel totally separate. Um, for instance, the, the, the performance of um, Alec and and I am little band of so silver apples. It's not really silver apples. You didn't hear any silver apples in it, but, but it's sort of based on it. And his interpretation of what I was doing is very different than what I was doing. And I think that's really good. I think that's really good. I don't think really following someone is a good idea. How many people here uh, might have worked with Mark or seen him performing in San Francisco in the 60s. Is there anybody? No. <laughs> Nobody? That's really interesting. 
I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I asked if anybody here saw you perform at the Tate Music Center. I've been to them. In the 60s? In the 60s, right. But nobody was there. Yeah. None yeah. of these people. <laughs> I can tell you something that oh, I gave up, as I mentioned in the, in the film, I gave up putting my clarinet playing for my biography for years. It, it's only been back in, in <laughs> the last 10 years or so. Um, so people didn't know I played the clarinet. And I, that was important to me. Um, and we were doing, uh, Joan was, Joan and I were invited by, by the, we're in San Francisco, right? The San Francisco Symphony, when they were doing a big thing on new music. And I was doing a part of Jacob's Room and, and Joan was doing something else. And we were at rehearsals at the, 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 where the symphony played. And we were coming out of the rehearsal and we got a cab. They had put us in a hotel I had never been in before. It was up, um, up in the hills somewhere. Um, and so we needed a, a cab to get there. We get in the cab and um, he says, the cab driver says, you could be playing with the San Francisco Symphony and I didn't feel like talking, so Joan said, you know, she told everything that we were doing and everything, and, and she started with herself and told her what was it, and then she, she says, and, and my husband um, writes this music, and he looks to the thing, to the rearview mirror, this <laughs> important part of my life, the rearview mirror, yeah. and, uh, and he pulls over to the side, he said, my God, Martin Sabotnik. And he turns to her and he said, you should have heard him play the clarinet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we did hear you play it tonight. And it was uh, you had a beautiful tone. So it's absolutely thrilling to have that segment in the film. Don't take it out of the film. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. Well, I'm glad the dog got hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to thank you all for coming, and uh, please come on Thursday night and, and uh, check out the performance of Moritz Botnik and Willibad. And uh, Mort, thank you very much for making this.